Welcome. You're listening to Women's Health and Beyond with Dr. David Goslin, the only podcast for women providing a physician's point of view on everything relating to women's health, sexual medicine, and cosmetic gynecology. Get ready to discover the latest and hottest topics in women's health and how they relate to you. Hey everyone, welcome to our podcast. This podcast is about Bartholin glands and Bartholin cysts that sometimes can turn into Bartholin abscesses. Not a topic of discussion we always like to have, but one that's important and affects about 2% of women for annual visits to their gynecologist. So what is it? A Bartholin gland is sometimes called a greater vestibular gland, and it's usually irritated during sexual stimulation And these glands, the purpose of these glands is to actually release lubricant, a lubricant type of fluid during intercourse. It was actually first described as in 1977 by Dr. Bartholin. And since then, we've worked on treatment models um, in order to help alleviate the pain that's associated with these glands. My podcast today is about not only telling you what a Bartholin gland is and some of the treatments that are out there, but more importantly, I want to tell you about a procedure that I did not invent, but I modified and brought over from Italy, and I'm currently the only one doing it within the United States, and that's using a fractional CO2 laser to treat Bartholin glands. Using my treatment model, we've treated about 150 patients in the last year and a half, and we've had three recurrences thus far, so really, really effective. But before I get into that, I just want to talk a little bit about the background and what some of the signs and symptoms are associated with this phenomenon. First of all, in a study done out of Korea, and no, not North Korea, but South Korea, they found that the average age demographics is between 15 to 50 years, predominantly in the late 30s to early 40s. The risk of cancer from these cysts is very low. However, in a woman age greater than 40 who presents to her gynecologist, it would probably be prudent to do a biopsy of the gland just to make sure it's not associated with any sort of cancer. So why do they happen? They usually happen because there's an obstruction at the duct, the Bartholin gland duct, that brings the fluid it excretes out into the inner part of the vagina. And if it gets obstructed, and it usually does because of multifactorial bacteria, we call these normal vaginal floras. Sometimes, though, it can be associated with gonorrhea and chlamydia. So if there's promiscuous relationships or something happened, you may want to get tested for that as well. The most common symptom of a Bartholin uh, gland abscess or cyst is pain. So patients will present with not only feeling like there's a walnut-sized growth or a tennis ball, I've even seen them as big as grapefruits. So obviously the discomfort, not just visually, but physically is there. But usually, even if they're small, their presenting symptom is pain, pain sitting down, pain walking, having intercourse is nearly impossible, exercising is very uncomfortable. And so that is typically the presentation of a Bartholin gland. So how is it treated? There's two ways to treat Bartholin glands. You can go the conservative route, which I usually recommend as a first-line treatment. As always, you want to do surgery or invasive procedures as a second line. So as a first-line treatment, we're we're talking about SIDS baths. I'm a big fan of SIDS bath. Epsom salt, about a half a cup worth in a bathtub, sitting in it for about 20 minutes. You can do that up to four times a day. That really does two things. The sodium concentration from the Epsom salt tries to soak up and pull some of that fluid stuck in that cyst. So obviously shrinking the cyst really is helpful. And second of all, it's a really good cleanser. But another little trick that I've been using lately is actually using essential oils. And so if you look at the, there's so many amazing essential oils and actually we have an aromatherapist Jody, who's going to join us on the podcast, not today, but with other podcasts, and we can talk about it with her. But essential oils have been around for thousands of years. And for example, I usually recommend adding cypress. Cypress helps to increase circulation and help with drainage. And I also like lavender. 
because lavender has anti-inflammatory properties. So sometimes you can get Epsom salt with infused with essential oils. Otherwise, you can make your own formulation. I would take a 15 millimeter, a 15 milliliter bottle, and I would add about 125 drops of cypress and about 50 drops of lavender. And then I would take that little bottle and I would put about four or five drops in your SIDS bath and allow yourself to soak in addition with the Epsom salts. And usually that's a good first line treatment option, but sometimes it's just not enough. If it's not enough or it appears that there is an infectious process going on, then you definitely want to see your gynecologist who will probably put you on an antibiotic to calm the infection down. If the size of the cyst is big enough or the pain is significant enough, then we may want to move forward with doing an invasive procedure. Typically, if you see a gynecologist in the United States or in the world, they're going to start with an algorithm. They'll usually recommend antibiotics, which we just talked about. And secondly, they'll talk about doing an incision and drainage. They're going to incise the, the gland. They're going to drain all that pussy fluid out. They're going to clean it with normal saline. And they have two options. They're either going to leave that alone, but the chance of recurrence with that is very high, or they're actually going to do something called a word catheter. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. The other options is marsupialization um, or using... My technique, fractional CO2, uh, for cauterization and desiccation of the internal capsule. And finally, really the gold standard is actual surgical removal of the entire Bartholin gland. This is quite an invasive procedure, not routinely performed, and one that most people shy away from because it is associated with a lot of intraoperative bleeding and postoperative pain. So let's talk about some of these procedures before we get to mine. So if we talk about marsupialization, um, <clears throat> that's where we actually make an incision into the, we, the way it works is it's usually done under local anesthesia. However, it can be done under general, depending on uh, the anxiety of the patient or the comfort of the physician. Uh, local numbing medication is injected if it's done under local. Once that happens, about a three, 1.5 to 3 centimeter longitudinal incision is made on the cyst itself. And once the, the fluid is drained, the cyst is cleaned with normal saline. And at this point, in order to keep the cyst from closing back up, we're going to actually suture like a baseball stitch the cyst capsule to the outer edge of the internal labia allowing for almost a tiny little hole, an artificial draining spot. And over time, that will get smaller, but it will allow for continuous drainage of that cyst and hopefully minimize the chances of recurrence. In a randomized prospective study of 83 women who underwent marsupialization, they found about a 24% chance of recurrence. So a quarter of the people were getting the, the symptoms back. So not the best of outcomes in my opinion. Word catheter, a little easier. That's typically done in the office or in the emergency room or urgent care, wherever you present. And for those who don't know, word catheters um, were invented by Dr. Ward and also done at a local. So a little local numbing medication in the area. Same thing, small incision above the capsule, drainage of the capsule, cleaning the internal cyst of the capsule and then placing this rubber tiny little catheter that we actually use about three to five cc's of saline to blow up a little balloon so it stays inside. And it's supposed to stay inside for about four to six weeks. Guess what? Unfortunately, most of them fall out within a few days. They're not the most comfortable, especially if you're going to get dressed for work or run errands. <clears throat> and the recurrence rate is also high enough that although effective, not quite, in my opinion, what should be first line. They quote the recurrence rate with work catheter, catheters close to about 17%. So where are we at? About a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, I was treating Bartholin cyst in my practice the same way as everybody else. I came across a study in Italy that showed really good outcomes using fractional CO2 laser and I read through the study and how they did it. And I said, my God, I'm already using fractional CO2 laser in my office. I can do this. And at that time, I had a couple 
recurrent Bartholin cyst abscesses that I was treating, and I decided after talking to the patients to give it a try here in the U.S. We did it. It worked beautifully. I was already also using what's called PRP, platelet-rich plasma. I love platelet-rich plasma. I call it my liquid gold. It's full of growth factors <clears throat> and helps improve circulation and great healing properties. And so I started injecting PRP into the cyst wall after I'm, I used my fractional CO2 laser. And I think that's made a big difference in our outcomes. So like I mentioned earlier, I've done about, I don't know, 150 cases. And I've had an extremely low recurrence rate. So low that I actually will offer one additional treatment within one year if it happens again. And I've only had to do that twice. And both times we had good success after redoing it. So the procedure, which I'm going to have a couple of my patients come on the air with us today, we'll talk about how and the reason why they decided to move forward with the procedure, but it's pretty simple. It's very similar to everything I've talked about already. <clears throat> it's done under local anesthesia. You come to my office, uh, you're watching TV while you do this. I clean the area first, and then we give you some local numbing medication. The area goes completely numb, so you feel nothing while I'm doing it. I use my fractional CO2 laser. The tip of it is about the size of a hair follicle. That allows me very good precision. I make my incision. I go down with my fractional CO2 laser, enter the cyst wall. And once I enter the cyst wall, all this pussy fluid comes out. I then clean the cyst with normal saline. And then I use my fractional CO2 like a spray and I spray the internal capsule wall of the cyst. And once I'm done with that, during that time, my nurse has already drawn your blood because I need your blood to, to, to formulate PRP because I don't add any foreign objects to it. It's 100% natural. It belongs to you, so you can't have a side effect to it. She gives it back to me. It looks like liquid gold. That's because I've taken your plasma and your platelets, and then I inject that into the cyst wall, and that's going to improve healing and also help with revitalizing some of that tissue. Um, that's the whole procedure. I then put one or two sutures that self-dissolve just to close up the space. You stay with me for about 20 minutes and you go home. Usually the next day you can go back to work. Um, however big, I've we've taken care of cysts the size of a grapefruit and patients returning back to work the next morning um, in such better spirits. So Really completely back to normal activities, including intercourse within three weeks. So a very, I wouldn't say painless, but I would say relatively painless procedure with quick recovery time. And that's really the nuts and bolts of uh, Bartholin cysts and how to treat them. Um, like I said, most gynecologists in the United States will use the incision and drainage technique, the marsupialization, the word catheter. I also recommend SIDS baths, as everybody else does. I also recommend the use of essential oils. Um, and usually by the time you come to me, patients find me because they've unfortunately failed conventional therapy and they're looking for something more definitive and less invasive. So on that note, I want to introduce the audience to a couple of my patients um, and we'll hear their story and how I treated them and helped them. So today with us, we have Lourdes. Lourdes was actually one of my patients, and I asked her to come on the show. Um, and she's going to tell us a little bit about the history of what happened with her in regards to her Bartholin cyst. And um, I'm going to let you take over, Lourdes. Tell us a little bit about your history with it. Okay. Um, hello. Uh, so let's see. I First of all, discovering you have a Bartholin cyst is kind of weird and scary because like no one ever talks about it <laughs> even though it's so common so i at first so it's not locker know. room talk no not not quite not a lot no so i didn't know what it was at first i thought i had like maybe a hernia or something because that's kind of what it looked like it looks like to me it looks like a, a hernia and it, it was like painful um and and I didn't really know what was going on. So I went to my OB and she was like, oh, it's this, you know, she explained what Bartholin glands were and like, and that I had this cyst and she's like, good news. It's, it's not infected. And, and she's like, so just, you know, sit in a warm bath um, and hopefully it'll go away. And I was like, 
okay. And at this point, it had been like a, like a month or two. I was like, just sit in a bath. And I was like, I don't, you know, I live in LA in an apartment. I don't have a bathtub. That's um, a good point. <laughs> and so she was like, okay, well, then you're going to have to buy a sits bath and you're going to have to sit, you know, 15 minutes, three times a day, 15 to 20 minutes, three times a day. And I was like, wait, I have to sit in warm water in a sits bath for an hour every day and hopefully it'll go away on its own okay so i did that for about two weeks did Um, it help no no (laughs) not really at all maybe it went down just slightly uh, but not significantly and so i went back to her and she was like okay well then you know we can have surgery and i was like okay well give me the well what 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 does this surgery involve and she told me that unless i want to take my gland completely out which i don't it's a very important gland i don't want to take it out um that i had to you know get it drained and they put in this balloon and then and like a tube and i had to like not move for a whole week and then i couldn't really be on my feet really so lourdes i'm just going to stop you Mm-hmm. Because I, I, I spoke a little bit before about treatment options, and one of mm-hmm. them was the word cath- catheter, and that's what Lourdes is describing, putting yes. that little balloon catheter inside the gland and letting it sit there for four to six weeks, which is a crazy amount of time. It's a crazy amount of time, and I cannot, I could not believe that my options were sit in a bath for an hour a day, maybe it'll go away, hopefully, or have this really invasive surgery that'll take forever. And also it's not, there's like no guarantee that it will fully go away. I think isn't the percentage of it coming back is absurdly high. Yeah. It's about 17%. Yes. And so I was just like, this cannot be my only option. I can't not work for that long. I don't know who can, I don't know who has that luxury but I don't have that luxury. So then I started doing some research online and I found you and um, I set up an appointment and we talked and I was like, well, this at at the very least, the recovery time is so much shorter. And, um, and I, I went, I went with, with the laser treatment. Awesome. So, yeah. Lourdes, the day of the surgery, what happened? Well, I won't even call it surgery. The day of the procedure, when you came to the office, did I put you to sleep? Did you Were you awake? No, I was awake the whole time. I was watching Netflix. Uh, <laughs> I was watching TV the whole time. And numbed me. You guys numbed me. Um, took some blood for the, yep, that's the that PCP, PRP. Right? The PRP. PRP. Yep. PRP. Um, for the PRP numbed me down there and um it was there was pressure but it wasn't like it wasn't that bad and it was pretty fast so i would say it was like 45 minutes yeah including procedure. the numbing about 45 minutes yeah it was about 45 minutes i feel like i was in and out of there in about an hour um and you know that very same day i went and i i had the the surgery, the procedure, I would say. I had the surgery at 10 a.m. And at 4 p.m. I went and had an audition that same day. And then a Welcome to Los later, Angeles. <laughs> that's crazy. I didn't know that. Yeah, I went well, that's to an audition news. the same day. It was, you know, I was uncomfortable, but I could do it. Good. Which was my, I knew it would be uncomfortable, but, you know, if I had gone the other route, I wouldn't have been able to do that. And then a couple of days later, I was, I was on set shooting uh, for a job. So, and I couldn't have done that had I done the other procedure either. So, so Lourdes, let me ask you, how did you take pain medications afterwards? I took just a prescription strength ibuprofen and uh, uh, smoked marijuana as needed. That's so funny that you bring that up. <laughs> I'm not going to condone smoking marijuana. <laughs> However, I'm a big proponent of CBD and post procedures, and we're going to do an entire podcast on that. So stay tuned yes, for that one. Yes. So I got um, a mostly i would i think it was like a 99 percent cbd strain and that's just how i um managed my pain which that's wasn't great that much. Yeah. so lourdes let me ask you how are you feeling today feeling
feeling pretty great. Um, um, I did have to come, remember. I did have to come back because I had a a rare twin cyst. Yep. And actually, so. I get. I have to. You, I'm going to let you tell the audience mm-hmm. uh, about your recurrence. But Lourdes was actually an interesting case. She had a kissing cyst, we call it. So the front end was the cyst we took care of initially, but there was a second lobulated cyst in the back, deeper, that we actually didn't feel the first time we did the surgery. And then once that space was given, the second kissing cyst actually presented itself. So we repeated it for Lourdes. But the best thing is, as you guys could tell, Lourdes is an actress. And it was the (laughs) day before Super Bowl. Do you remember that? Yeah. And you told me you were doing a commercial that was appearing on Super Bowl for uh-huh. Cheetos. And so I went and ran and got a couple bags of Cheetos so you could sign it for me so I could pass it around during the day of the Super Bowl. Yeah, that was the very first time I've ever signed uh, autographs, <laughs> and I was, like, pantless. And I think that's a... Uh, Anyways, we had fun. That it just it just states that the procedure. Listen, we're you know I'm very engaging, and when we're doing the procedure, I try to make the patients feel comfortable. So there's a lot of communication and interaction, and a lot of times because the surgery is not complex and it's not a bloody procedure, we're able to have a good time and and and, and share stories. And this was a funny, funny one. Yeah. Anyways, I'm glad you're doing better, Lourdes. I think that yeah, I am. Um, you explained it really well. I didn't prep you for this. And you sort no. of nailed all the points that I talked about beforehand, which was SIDS baths, offering word catheters, and those not always being the best option. And I'm glad you found us. And Me too. Any last words for the audience before I let you go, Lourdes? And thank you. Oh, um, I guess do your research and go with the, I don't know, I, I wish I wish this this procedure was was not you know the one that's automatically offered it's crazy that i don't i don't know it's crazy that not a lot of people know about it or that it's not even op- an option that's presented because it's to me the only real world viable option well you know this is more of an opinion than nothing based on facts but um, having been a board-certified trained physician in the United States, it some, sometimes baffles me that not only European countries, other countries throughout the world will sometimes come out with great treatment modalities, and it takes so many years for them to make their way to the United States when you mm-hmm. would think we would adopt these right away. Mm-hmm. If it wasn't for me coming across that article a few years ago and just on my own deciding to take this on as a challenge, we would not be offering this today. Which is, Which is I'm sad. so glad I'm so glad you did because like I, I, I don't know what I would have done. I would have lost so much time and money and peace of mind um, having to be forced to, to go the catheter route. I can't even imagine. That's right. Lourdes, I thank you. Thank you for your time and, and sharing your story with everybody. Um, and I appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Goslin. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. So as you can tell, this is just a typical patient that comes and finds us for this fractional CO2 procedure. Um, I'm going to do one more call with another patient just to give you guys a different perspective. And uh, these are just patients that I've done in the past. I haven't prepped any of them, so I really have no clue whether they're going to say something good or bad or what they've done in the past. I I, I really wanted you guys, the audience, to really hear an uncontrolled, fresh story. And um, and so I'm gonna I'm, we're gonna call a second patient of mine. Her name's Lenise, and Lenise underwent the fractional CO2 laser procedure with us for her Barthlin abscess. Lenise, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, Dr. Goslin. Thank you. So welcome to the show, and thank you for uh, agreeing to come on. As I told the audience before, I haven't prepped any of you guys um, or really know what you're going to say, so hopefully it's something nice. Um, So tell me, I want to know, Lilanise, a little bit about the history of of what's been going on with your Barthlin. When did it start? What have you done? What's sort of been the timeline? So I I, we just want to hear about you and and what's happened. Um, I've been battling Barthlin cyst, um, gosh, pretty much most of my adult life, um, but over the last three years, they seem to be getting increasingly worse. 
Um, I've had them marsupialized. I've had them um, where they've gone and put in the worst um, shunt in them. I've had them lanced, and nothing has seemed to help me. Um, so I finally found you and went on your website and called your office and made an appointment for a consultation. Well, that's great. I'm glad you did. But I want to know also, so I know it hurts, but tell us about the pain. Was it limiting in some ways? I mean, were you able to lead a normal life with it or was it completely (laughs) debilitating? Um, No, the pain was really, really bad. Um, It limited my ability to exercise. Um, I like to do um, soul cycling um, and I wasn't able to, it was really uncomfortable to be able to sit down. Um, It really um, inhibited me to be able to have a normal sex life. Um, So all of those things were really difficult, even just to be able to sit at work for long periods of time was very uncomfortable. So no, it really was um, very uncomfortable. Yeah, unfortunately, that seems to be a typical presentation, Lenise. And tell me something, is it always, does it always present on the same side or is it usually on on opposite sides? So just, you know, I think I forgot to mention and just for the audience. So where are they located? They're usually located between their, their bilateral on both sides of the inner labia um, and they're located on the, between the four and five o'clock and the seven and eight o'clock position so if you were to look at your vagina as a clock, that's where they would be, between 4 and 5 and 7 and 8 o'clock. And uh, usually it tends to be unilateral, so just committed to one side. Um, although I've had a couple of patients where I've treated one side and then all of a sudden for the first time the other side starts, which is rare yeah. and not typical. But tell us about you. Yeah, so for me, they've always been on the left side, and um, they would seem to get worse, like, you know, after I would have intercourse, um, they would always seem to flare up, um, and then just seem to go from there, Um, and antibiotics would help for a little bit, and then it would just, you know, again, um, seem to just start to flare up again, it would help for a little bit, and then seem to get worse. So tell us, so you finally found us and, and you saw you were a little intrigued about what we were doing that's pretty novel and outside the box for Barthlin Cis. So you came to us, how was your meeting with me and how did the procedure go? Um, the procedure went really well. Um, I called your office, I made an appointment. Um, they told me that you got you did um, complimentary consultation. So I came in, I met with you, you explained to me about the procedure and um I made my appointment, I came in, I was a little nervous, um, but you had a great bedside manner, so that actually helped, the nurse was great. Um, And um, I came in for my procedure, I was a little uncomfortable after the procedure, but after a couple of days, um, I felt much better actually, and since then, things of my life have been so much better. Um, Yeah. So, um, we just had a guest on earlier, and she... Uh, told us that she was watching Netflix during the procedure. Were you watching Netflix? Um, the, there is a TV in there. I didn't watch Netflix because I was talking to you guys the whole time. Um, so I didn't, but um, the nurse did offer to put something on for me, but I was busy asking about all the other procedures that you guys do in the office, so I chose not to watch TV. So just to walk the audience through the procedure, Lenise, let me just go through it with you and you tell me if I forgot something. So usually when you come in, we have our consultation. Sometimes we can do it on the same day if patients are flying from far. Otherwise, they usually reschedule for another time. Um, Once we've examined you, we decided you're the proper candidate. We clean the area. I use local numbing medication that I inject, just like if you go to the dentist, get a little tiny needle shot. Uh, A few minutes later, the whole area goes numb. I use my fractional CO2 to open up the cyst. I let it drain, take out all the pussy fluid, clean the inside of the cyst. Um, If there's any reason that's suspicious, I will biopsy and send to pathology, but that's pretty rare. Uh, Once I do that, then during that time, my nurse has already drawn your blood, and we use that. We spin it. It's called PRP, platelet-rich plasma. Once I've cleaned the cyst, I use my fractional CO2 laser to desiccate, to sort of cauterize the internal capsule of the cyst, which renders it inactive but doesn't destroy the duct. Then I inject a little PRP into that cyst wall. 
I put a couple dissolving sutures just to close the open space that's there. And that's the whole entire procedure. Does that sound about right to you? Yes. Uh -huh. That's exactly what they did. And I was fortunate enough to come in the morning and they were able to squeeze me in that afternoon because I was in excruciating pain. And, and right. then when they were done, they, they let... Um, they let my friends come in the room and sit with me for a little bit until I was able to go home. And we, we do typically place patients on antibiotics for five days post-procedure. And if needed, we do offer pain medication. But honestly, it's rare that people take anything beyond a strong Motrin or ibuprofen. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't need pain medication. Like, I was a little uncomfortable, but I didn't need anything for pain. And the nurse called me the next day to check on me. And then I came to see you a couple of days later. And you said that I was doing really well. So, Lenise, let me ask you. So, how long after the procedure were you able to get back? Since I heard you say you like soul cycling, I like soul cycling. How long did it take you to get back to exercising and to have intercourse? Um, I want to say I went back to soul cycling maybe three weeks later. Um, I was actually nervous to, um, having intercourse, so I want to say that didn't happen until maybe a month or so later just because I was nervous and I wanted to start my regular exercise routine first. Um, so the soul cycling took first because I wanted to see how I would feel back on the seat. <laughs> okay. And so how have you been doing since and how long has it been? Oh my gosh. I've been doing great since and it's been about seven months. Okay. That's great news. So I want to thank you again for your time, Lenise, and I appreciate your comments and opinions and, and it's really helpful for the audience to hear patients of mine that have gone through the procedure and uh, we'll chat soon. Okay, and I just want to say that the office is really great, the ease of scheduling. Everybody was really great in the office, so I just want to say kudos to you, Dr. Goslin, and the team. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. So there you have it, two patients out of probably 150 cases that I've done so far. Um, you know, interestingly enough, like I said in the earlier part of the segment, only 2% of the population will come in for this. So it's not like I was seeing tons of Bartholin cysts coming through my office. But after I did a couple of those procedures, the word started getting out, and now I'm doing maybe two to three a week. So, uh, And this has been going on for the past year and a half. So we've done a lot of these procedures, and I can really tell you firsthand, they work. It's effective. Um, it's done under local anesthesia. There's no need for hospitalization. Um, it's The patient satisfaction rate is really high. The risk factors are really low. The downtime is minimal, and then really the post-procedure pain is minimal. So all around, a win-win for Bartholin cysts. Um, I hope this segment of the podcast was helpful for you guys. If you have any questions, please feel free to email us, and we'll have that information for you. Info at davidgoslin.com. That's my name, spelled G-H-O-Z-L-A-N-D. Info at davidgoslin.com. Otherwise, I look forward to talking to you on the next podcast. This is Dr. David Goslin signing off. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of Women's Health and Beyond with Dr. David Goslin. If you found this episode informative, be sure to subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to ask Dr. Goslin a question, please visit our website at www.davidgoslin.com or connect on all social media platforms at David Goslin. We'll see you next week for another episode.